I'm going to cover a concept that everyone's familiar with, but which previously didn't have a name. And it's the essence of conducting a successful resuscitation in or out of hospital. At Sydney Hems, we have a million things that can go wrong. We have extremely complex critical care patients. We have many staff, doctors, paramedics, and working with flight nurses too. And our new doctors often haven't done pre-hospital care before. And new paramedics often haven't worked with a physician in a critical care team before. And we cover a, a huge area, nearly 3,000 missions a year, with road ambulances, rotary wing and fixed wing platforms covering a very large state. So we have some challenges. But how do we quantify and describe those challenges? We do it through rigorous system of case review from our daily coffee and case discussions through to formal morbidity and mortality, airway audit, and also looking at what went well in our learning from excellence cases. And the powerful thing that we discover in our service when we look at all of these cases and feed it back into our training system is that when things don't go optimally it's rarely due to clinical factors or clinical factors alone it's the other stuff so we need to find out what this other stuff is and feed it back into our training cycle with the skills knowledge and behaviors that we build in in training and we work out what that is from the case review the consistent finding that the difference between a great mission and one that could have been better is the non-clinical stuff then. So we have to optimize our non-technical aspects of performance. And we need to teach this in a memorable way. Because normally, when you learn about human factors or non-technical skills, it's interesting, but it's difficult to remember the tools and it's difficult to remember the concepts, particularly when you need to draw on them during a critical situation. So the structured way we want to deliver this is by considering something called the zero point survey. Now, of course, resuscitation often begins with the primary survey. That's how it's taught, the ABCD assessment. But that's not really when the clock starts. The time zero or the zero point might be at the time of mission tasking or when you're arriving on scene or when you're en route and you're discussing as a team what the plan's going to be. Or the zero point could even be at the start of your shift. This zero point is well before you touch a patient. And really, the process is in getting things right is to be able to control our physiological response to stress, get our heads in the zone, get our team prepared and control our environment by establishing and controlling our safe workspace. And then to maintain the mission momentum and to establish our clinical trajectory, we need to periodically update the team and establish the treatment priorities. So let's go through these in sequence starting with S for self. Everything starts with controlling ourselves and we can break down our preparedness into physical readiness and cognitive readiness. For physical readiness we can go through the I'm safe checklist. This is familiar to many and gives us a basic screen for physical readiness. Some of it's useful, a reminder to have a full stomach and empty bladder. That's helpful, but obviously the time of a canyon rescue tasking might not be the best opportunity to kick your drug or alcohol habit. And as for psychological preparedness, we aim to minimize the impact of the cognitive overload and the physiological stress response that can sometimes happen in busy cases with sick patients or even multiple patients. So there's a number of systems built into our approach that can reduce cognitive load, like having standard operating procedures, using our checklists, and also training by drilling procedures as part of airway currency training, for example. The aim through training is all about our threat challenge appraisal. So if we perceive a task or a mission as threatening, we're going to be stressed. If we perceive it as a positive challenge, though, we're less likely to experience stress. So it's all about our perception. And the way to manage this perception is to feel that you have the resources to manage it. Those resources being the skills, the knowledge and the systems in place that you've developed through training. So one way to reduce this threat appraisal, make it a challenge, is to use the BTSF mnemonic invented by Mike Lauria. So if you're feeling like you're stressed, then you're 
you have autonomic hyper arousal and you can bring this under control with controlled breathing so breathe means slow controlled breathing that can reduce tachycardia and improve your situational awareness and your feeling of control. Talk refers to positive self-talk, a silent internal monologue to remind yourself of your preparation and the resources available to you. C is visualization, imagining the successful completion of a procedure or a mission. And then F is focus. This is something you've rehearsed in advance, a favorite word or phrase or just a physical routine that triggers you, to, triggers you to action when there might otherwise be a psychological barrier. A good example being when putting knife to skin for a surgical airway or a hysterotomy. And the aim, of course, through training is we want to avoid being overwhelmed and we want to bring our trainees during induction training and simulation training to the edge of their cognitive limits so they know where those barriers are and they can recognize it through metacognition and use the psychological skills to reduce that threat appraisal reappraise it as a challenge and feel in control so that during a real mission as opposed to training we really don't feel that we've gone beyond that limit. The training has got us to a point where we can recognize those feelings, use the tools to bring them under control and treat everything as a challenge rather than as a threat. Having the mindfulness and metacognition to be in control of ourselves. So the next step is managing our team and with our team approach we really want to make sure that everyone knows their role and what tasks are allocated to those roles. So this is sharing the mental model of task work, what needs to be done, and teamwork, how the team will work together to complete those tasks. And part of team management is influencing and controlling potentially unhelpful or even, even sometimes hostile members of the team working for other services or, or other hospitals who may be under their own pressures and their own stresses which might be manifesting in a stress response that can result in some confrontation. So like it or not we are going to encounter people whose contribution to the team can be um, sometimes confrontational often through no fault of their own due to the pressures that they're under. And it always behoves us to be polite, be tactful, but to be assertive. And we can certainly practice the language skills, the tactical language skills associated with good leadership, teamwork, influence and persuasion. And some of those we cover during induction. The components of persuasion, some even some hypnotic techniques and graded assertiveness. After the teamwork, we think about controlling our environment. And the environment can contain threats to safety and threats to smooth mission flow. So after thinking about controlling those hazards that can threaten safety, we want to establish and maintain our controlled workspace, to own our resuscitative real estate. This is a key feature that differentiates expert pre-hospital providers from novices, owning your real estate, controlling your safe workspace. And in doing so, we will try to optimize the amount of space, the amount of light, the amount of heat, the amount of noise by minimizing noise and undertaking crowd control measures. So considering safety and then space, light, heat, noise and crowd. So we've done self, we've done team, we've done environment. And part of environment is thinking about where there's limited access to the patient and the situation then is to consider whether you move the things from the patient or the patient from the things. Always being mindful of course about what you're moving that patient towards. So we've controlled self, team, environment and patient and when we get to patient we do undertake our primary survey. And that's often the role of the physician while the paramedic is undertaking a survey of the scene and considering the logistics. And then at that point the team comes back together and shares the mental model, both the clinical mental model and the logistic mental model, the clinical plan and the logistic plan. And we'll consider what the immediate priorities are and then delegate those tasks to other members of the team. So this is all described nicely in our pre-hospital workflow. There's also an inter-hospital workflow diagram, which is all about getting yourself, team and environment in order before assessing the patient 
greeting the on-scene crew and then the physician will make a clinical assessment the paramedic will assist with monitoring stabilization access and the logistic plan will then come together share findings update what we found and what we consider the priorities to be so there you have a summary of how we like to train to manage non-technical skills, the human factors that can bite you in pre-hospital and retrieval medicine. And we do find that these apply equally in our in-hospital environments that we also work in. So I'd encourage everyone to consider including a zero-point survey at the beginning of the shift or beginning of tasking and on your way to the patient and as you arrive on scene uh, as a means of getting these non-technical skills um, managed in a memorable and teachable way that I hope can help us step up our resuscitation effectiveness.